get the Bible, I'll catch up with you. We've, we started chapter uh, 6 last time we were together, 1 Kings, and we were observing in the first half of this book how the Lord is showing us the United Kingdom and uh, you know, we saw Solomon's ascension to the throne and his uh, a prayer for a wisdom. And uh, here uh, he's building the temple in chapters 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. And uh, we saw in the uh, fifth chapter he was gathering the materials. And in the sixth chapter we're looking at some of the design and the details. And uh, we've been observing uh, typology as we go through. Now we understand historically that he's building the temple. But we also understand that the temple is the place where they uh, worshiped God. And uh, so let us continue here. Let me catch up with you in 1 Kings chapter uh, 6. And I believe last week we probably came through to about a verse uh, 16 around there. And we were observing that in the details of the particular temple, that the temple here, he's giving the uh, size of it, uh, 20 cubits on the side of the house in verse 16, and, um, and then it says in 17, in the house that is the temple before it was 40 cubits long. And our observations were that this temple was uh, twice the size of the uh, tabernacle. And we're looking at the difference. There are many uh, portraits being given here by God. Um, the tabernacle, of course, was a tent in the wilderness. And this here is, uh, is similar in terms of the design on the inside. It's got a holy place and a most holy place, but the dimensions are twice as large. And our observation was the temple would kind of be a picture of the Bible uh, because the temple, like Bible, is uh, now in a King James Bible, it's twice the size as to the uh, scrolls that wandered around the wilderness because they were only half a Bible, whether it was Hebrew or Greek. And so we saw that picture there. The temple also we're going to learn is a picture of the difference of how God houses a soul. And of course, your soul right now is housed in a tabernacle, which is like a tent. It's a very weak, uh, corruptible a type of housing for your soul. Paul refers to it that way in 2 Corinthians 5, that one day the very tabernacle that's wrapped around our soul will be uh, set aside and, and taken off us. And when that happens, then God's going to uh, clothe our soul with a new house, a house not made with hands, a house that's eternal. It's in the heavens. It was made from the heavens. We've born the earthy, in this little tabernacle, one day our soul will now be wrapped by a, a heavenly temple that God has made. A spiritual body will be wrapped around it. So there are many different portraits here. But going back to where we are um, historically, we're noticing that the work that he's doing, verse 18, as he's building this, he uses uh, the cedar of the house was uh, carved with knops and open flowers. All was cedar there was no stone seen. Now we understand that when he was erecting this uh, temple, he used stones and he used very solid, uh, enduring, uh, strong stones to hold this house. Now I don't know if you've ever uh, been involved in the building of a structure, but one of the best things you want is brick or stone. I was uh, observing the other day uh, coming down Transit Road and looking at many of the buildings, the commercial buildings that have been built and they're almost always a cinder block stone as opposed to the way a lot of the houses are, which is just two by fours, two by sixes with a sheet board and then aluminum siding over it. And I was thinking, why do they build these commercial structures that way? And the reason they build them is for sturdiness. They don't have to worry about windstorms. They don't have to worry about snow caving in a wall. They don't have to, uh, another thing about stone and brick is it lasts for generations. And when you build something made just of uh, two by fours or two by sixes, uh, it might only last 30 or 40 years, but stone can last, uh, their good stone buildings last hundreds of years. So, so there's a lot of forethought. Now the temple was being built that way too. However, when this temple was built, what they do is, although there's strong structural material put in it, he overlays it with cedar 
and that's what's seen. None of the stone is seen. Now, here's, here's the way it works. Your faith today is a structurally built on a rock and it's deep inside of you and yet it's covered over with this material. Sometimes a God will liken us to trees. And so it's like uh, men as trees walking and that's what is seen by people. But the, the strong faith we have on the inside is a rock. It's, uh, you know, wood burns. Stone doesn't. The faith we have does not burn up. It, it's not subject to the fires of hell. It's not subject to the fires of, of men's anger because that, that we have a strong internal faith that's built on the rock. But it's covered over with the uh, cedar here. And uh, notice he carves it with knops and with open flowers. So it's not just flat, it's a decorative, like a paneling that he's decorated all through the temple as they walked in. You don't see the stone, but what you see is these carved cedar, knops and uh, open flowers. Now the knops is like a knob or, or a, a bud or um, a little button. And an open flower is big. So it's a portrait of foliage in, in two stages of growth. It's in the little tiny budding stage and it's in the big blossoming stage. And, and here is the portrait when you meet the people of God. You've got uh, baby Christians, Paul says, and you've got spiritual Christians that have now had a time to grow in their faith and to blossom. And so that's what God expects to see in the church. When he comes into a church or he comes into an assembly, he's expecting to see the two types. He's not going to have all budding flowers here. Not everybody's going to be 30 years in the faith that's had a long time to walk with God. Some are just going to be knobs and they're buds and they're just starting out. And our job is, just as here at the temple displays, is to take time with the young so they can grow up. It should be a mixture within the temple of God that there's going to be the young and the more mature. And so the portrait is right there. Uh, verse 19, he says in the oracle... Uh, he prepared in the house within to set there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And the oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in breadth and 20 cubits in height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and so covered the altar which was of cedar. And so Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold and he made a partition by the chains of gold before the oracle. He overlaid it with gold. The whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar that was by the oracle he overlaid with gold. Now you've got the two uh, types of elements in there. You've got the cedar wood and the gold. Now this is a picture doctrinally of Jesus Christ. The cedar wood represents his earthly humanity aspect. The gold represents his heavenly deity aspect nature. And so you've got these two things represented here. And of course the temple in the doctrinal sense is a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in his fullness. And you have both there. But you have the same, and, and I mean historically, when you walked into this temple, it was magnificent. It was uh, precious. It was exceeding magnificent and expensive. There was a lot put into the building of this particular temple. As a matter of fact, in, if you look at Second Chronicles chapter 3, uh, every so often we'll look at a parallel passage here, and here are the priests recording it. And in Second Chronicles chapter 3, he will mention in uh, verse 8 the amount of gold that he used in terms of that covering. And it says, uh, and he made Second Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, you see, then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord and he built it in Mount Moriah. And uh, it says in verse 8, and he made the most holy house, the length thereof was according to the breadth, 20 cubits, and uh, the breadth thereof, 20 cubits. And of course, the height was the same thing we just learned in that other chapter. So it was 20 by 20 by 20. And he overlaid it with fine gold. This is gold that had been purged of its dross, uh, amounting to 600 talents. Now, a talent in the Hebrew weight is the equivalent of 12 
hundred ounces. One talent is twelve hundred ounces. So uh, on the spot market today, when I looked, gold uh, is about uh, twelve hundred and ten dollars an ounce. So twelve hundred and ten times twelve hundred. One talent is $1,452,000 in today's market. This was 600 talents. So it's 600 times 1.452 million, which means the uh, amount of gold on the inside of that uh, temple was $871,200,000 worth of gold. It was exceeding magnificent. Now, where did that gold come from? Did God drop it out of heaven? No, it actually it was given by the, the people of God. Amen. They gave their rings. They gave their earrings. They gave their jewelry. David made some contributions. Solomon made some contributions. The priests made contributions. Everybody contributed to the building of that temple. $871,200,000 worth of gold was given up in order to build that, that temple. In other words, here's the truth. I don't particularly like this truth, so turn off the tapes. But um, <laughs> this is not a pretty truth. But, but here, here, here's the truth, and I don't like this truth. But it's truth, and I'm sorry i got to deal with facts. The fact is, uh, people say, God doesn't need your money. And you know, he doesn't. He's sitting on a throne in heaven doing just fine. I think, I think the, the house is paid for up there. I don't think he has any property tax. I think he's got the utility bills covered. He doesn't need your money up there. But down here, he does. He, he doesn't have money down here. You got the money. You pay for the work of God down here. He doesn't pay for it. You do. You get to work and you get to contribute to the work of God down here. Now, when he comes back one day and he sets up the millennial kingdom, he will control it all and he'll have the cattle on a thousand hills. But right now, God doesn't have money. His people do. And in order to build his work, his people have to give a little bit. I'm, I should probably teach another uh, series, which I did a few years ago, called Grace, Purpose, Giving where you purpose in your heart to give by grace according as God hath given to you. These Jewish people, that of what they had, of what God had blessed them with when they left Egypt, they took and they gave substantial amount to the building of this uh, temple. And so, so uh, you know, having gone through the numbers, I was stunned at learning that one talent is 1,200 ounces and an ounce of gold is $1,200 an ounce. So this is $850 million worth of gold in the temple alone, not counting the cedar wood. By the way, cedar paneling is expensive. Go one day to Home Depot and buy not cheap pine paneling, but cedar, quality cedar paneling, and see what one piece costs, just an 8 by 4 piece. There's a lot of work that went into this, and it was God's people that gave willingly. And uh, talking with missionaries and pastors, we need uh, God's people to step forward again and to give willingly to the work of God. Amen. Yes, brother. So what is dross? Oh, dross is an impurity that would be found often when you go out into a, a gold mine or a silver mine and you begin to mine the mineral. The mineral will come forth, but it's often got impurities of various other metals like iron and brass and other things in it. And then what you want to do is you want to refine it by fire and burn the other impure metals out so that you have a refined gold or a refined silver on your hands. I mean, for example, this ring, uh, they didn't come out in this manner. That talk about carats, uh, 12 carat, 18 carat, 24 carat. 24 carat gold is pure gold. It's, it's got all the dross taken out of it. You rarely get a, a piece of jewelry like that because that type of gold tends to be very malleable. So they'll leave a little bit of a chromium in there to give it some sturdy. So usually the best you'll get is uh, 18 carat, usually 12 or 14. But there's a little dross in it. But here... The dross was taken out because it wasn't needed for structure anymore. It was needed for glory and for shimmering, shining light. And so it was a purified gold, very expensive. The more purified, the more it is per ounce. Yeah. Okay. Back to where we are. 
in the first Kings uh, chapter six, and we see him overlaying it. Now, again, when I was looking at the dimensions, um, one more time, uh, verse 20, it's in 20 that he gives it dimensions. It's uh, 20 cubits in length, it's uh, 20 cubits in the breadth, and it's 20 cubits in the height. So it's 20 times 20 times 20, that's 8,000. Eight. Um, eight, as we know, is, th is something new. It's like the new birth. It's almost a portrait here because the old tabernacle was 10 by 10 by 10. And I don't know if you remember, but when I gave you the dimensions of the tabernacle, I showed you there was prophecy contained within the dimensions of the tabernacle. And uh, it, it prophesied the number of years that the law would exist. And the law existed for 1,500 years, and that was prophesied in the dimensions of the outer courtyard. And then in the innermost holy place, it was 10 by 10 by 10, which is 1,000, which had prophesied the number of years that the Lord Jesus Christ would be with his uh, people 1,000 years with his glory in front of them. And then in the little place where the priests did their work, it was uh, 20 by 10, which is uh, 20 by 10 by 10. So it worked out to be 2,000, which was uh, uh, the prophecy of how long the age of grace would be. So the outer courtyard, 1,500 for the law. Then you step into the place where the priest minister, 2,000 years for the age of grace, which is the, uh, the church age. And then you finally have 1,000 years when you're with uh, the Lord himself in the millennium. And so all the dimensions were contained in the tabernacle that way. And here he's got 20 by 20 by 20, which is 8,000. And I think the portrait here is as we get into the 8,000th year forward, that's Revelation 21 and 22. That's after the millennium is done, and everybody at that time dwells inside the temple given by God, which means everyone has at that point the spiritual body, which means at that point everybody has been born again that goes forward into the 8,000th year if they're dwelling with God. And I think that's the portrait he's trying to give here in terms of prophecy. But what we're observing is everything has been doubled. The dimensions have been doubled. And the temple being a picture of the Bible, it's been doubled. The English Bible is doubled versus the old Hebrew and Greek. It's twice as big. And, and the, this most holy place has been doubled. Now, what was put in the most holy place? He uses the term, the ark, and he connects it to the oracle eight times in this chapter. Again, eight being the number of the new birth. Now, the ark, when uh, they were first given the instructions by God in Exodus chapter 25, and he told Moses to tell Aholiab and Bezaliel exactly how to build these things, and God God directed exactly how his worship would be because proper worship is in spirit and in truth and truth only comes from God's mouth because God is truth and so all worship that is going to be uh, acceptable to God must be his way and so when he was directing this the very most important uh, piece of furniture in the ark was the first one given and and so what God was doing in terms of the direction as I told you you can approach the temple or the tabernacle in two directions one is from God's direction so here God begins in the most holy place, lays the ark down, and then works out through the holy place, through the courtyard to people. That's a picture of grace. That's from God outwards. That's grace. The Levitical shows the opposite, coming from the courtyard into the holy place, into the most holy place, and that's how you approach God by faith. And faith, you're coming in your direction, meets grace. That's God coming in his direction. But when God starts with grace, the first and most important piece he speaks of is the ark. The ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant of the testimony of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. And he lays this down and there's about 12 different names that he gives to that ark because this is God's governmental number. And, and in the scriptures, I don't know if you remember, there were three arks in the scriptures. The first one was the Ark of Noah, and that housed eight people in it, and they were all adults. Then in the book of Exodus, there was the little Ark of Bulrushes that Moses was placed in as a baby, and Pharaoh's daughter found him in that thing. And that housed a, an infant or a child, a little baby child in it. 
And, uh, and then finally, we have the ark of the testimony of the Lord. Now, what God is trying to show you is that the ark of God's testimony becomes the ark of salvation. And, and in the Noahic ark, it's a picture of uh, Noah preached to people, men and women. And those that received it were saved. And in the Moses ark, it's a picture that that ark of salvation is for children because God saves children. Of such is the kingdom. This is God's love toward children. But here is the real ark, the most important piece of furniture. Because inside this ark, go to Hebrews chapter 9. Am I going too fast? Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Now the Lord gave all these portraits to us uh, for shadows and for types. And of course the shadows and the types pointed toward the body or the substance which is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so he tells you in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1, Then verily of the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. Ordinances are a particular order. God had given orders as to how divine service would be given. And in order to do that, it had a worldly sanctuary. It was a sanctuary that was set up here in the world. Because the true sanctuary is in heaven. Right. Now, verse 2. There was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was a candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Notice they're approaching God. And the first thing they come into is that little area where the priests work, where there's a candlestick and a table and, uh, with the showbread. Okay? And so uh, th they have an area here where the candlestick would represent the light and the illumination of the Holy Spirit on the table of showbread, which would represent, let's say, the Bible. But if you get past that and you get past the second veil, verse 3, you come into the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Amen. And now you're approaching the area where God is. And what you see, verse 4, is it had the golden censer. That's prayer. And, and what he's saying is when, when you get close to God, that's communion with God is through prayer. And now you're approaching the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. That's the deity representing Jesus Christ, the heavenly aspect. What was inside it? Wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So contained inside that little ark, which, gosh, it was the size maybe of a treasure chest when he gave the dimensions of it, but also looked like a mini coffin, and inside that was contained these three pieces. The, he tells you right there. There they are again. They're the um, Ark of the Covenant is in there. Let me just see. Um, the Tables of the Covenant. So, so the Ark is now going to represent the, the Lord Jesus Christ made of the incorruptible Shittim wood that says humanity that was incorruptible. He never sinned as a man. He never sinned in deed. He never sinned in word. He never sinned in thought as a man. The, the devil tried him and found nothing in him. And he, all his temptations he passed with flying colors. And yet he's wrapped with gold and that's the deity. And what, it, what is him? inside him was the, the uh, Ten Commandments. Amen. Now the difference was, remember, the Ten Commandments were first given to the man named Moses. What did Moses do with the Ten Commandments when he came down? He broke them. Moses is a representative of the law. And, and Moses, a good man, probably as good as any man in this audience, maybe even better than a few men in this audience, and yet he could not keep the Ten Commandments, showing you that a man, even a good man, a prophet of God, even the friend of God, uh, couldn't keep those Ten Commandments. A man living by the law couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. But yet inside of Jesus Christ, the Ten Commandments were unbroken. So the first thing it's showing is inside the person of Christ, he kept all Ten Commandments. He kept them physically. There was no transgression. He kept them spiritually. There was no iniquity. 
He never even broke them in his mind or in his heart, which I'm sure a few of us may have been guilty of doing in our mind and our heart. He kept that. The next thing that was inside there was uh, the manna. The manna represented the bread from heaven. The, the Jewish people called it light bread. A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And thy commandment and thy word is a lamp and a light to me. And it's a picture of the Bible. And it's a portrait that the Lord Jesus Christ kept the Ten Commandments and he fed on the word of God. And you say, why did he have to? Because when he left heaven's glory, and he took upon himself the form of a servant. And he was born as a child, a baby. As he grew, it says in Luke 2.52, he had to grow in wisdom and in stature. He had to grow just like any other child. And, and he had to uh, feed on something. And he, he, he never liked reruns. He didn't like first-run TV shows. He enjoyed reading the Bible. And he fed on the manna. And that's what he meditated on. And so he fed himself. So the manna is a picture of it being inside of the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept the Bible. He kept the Ten Commandments. And the other thing was in it was Aaron's rod that budded. And in that story of the book of Numbers, it talks about every member of a tribe, one leader of each tribe, brought a, a branch from the wilderness and put it by the tabernacle. And the next morning, the Lord allowed one of those branches to come back to life, a dead branch to come back to life and bud. It's a picture of a body being resurrected. And so, so this ark that's placed in the most holy place is a picture of the fact that the most holy place, getting close to God, requires coming through Jesus Christ. And on top of that ark was built the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was above the law because inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. And the mercy seat was above the manna. And the mercy seat rests on the budding resurrection. And God's mercy is above you keeping the law and above you reading the Bible. And God's mercy is above all that. And you no longer live under the law. You live under the grace and mercy of God. And that's the way that you approach God. And so the portraits were given here. And that was put into the most holy place. So the, the most holy place historically was the place where the presence of the glory of God was in the midst of his people. And today we have the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ doctrinally. And that's where God's in the midst of his people. And spiritually, what the most holy place represents to us is this is the place where truth resides on planet earth. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth, and the life. And the only way you can know truth is coming to the oracle of God, that would be the Bible, and within that oracle, coming to Jesus Christ. You just can't search the Scriptures and look for what you want, although you'll find good science in there, although you'll find a good evidence of creation in there, although you'll find good history about the nation Israel and how God has dealt with Gentile nations over the years, all those things. But if you search the Scriptures, you have to find the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is the spirit of prophecy, and that's how you come to God. That oracle represents you coming to the ark, and that's where God's glory is contained today. And it's sad for me to see people who intermeddle with the Bible and, and they don't know Jesus Christ. Now, there may not be a lot of them, but there's enough of them on this planet that are going to be very heartbroken one day when they stand before God and realize, but I read that passage and I quoted that passage and I knew that book, but I never knew you, says the Lord, because you never came to the Ark of the Covenant and you never got to the glory of God. Back to where we are in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 23. And so as, as uh, God's giving them directions in building this uh, the temple, it says, And within the oracle, that's the most holy place, he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub, from the uttermost part of the one wing unto the othermost part of the other were ten cubits. So, so I don't know, I'll, try, I'll pretend I'm a cherub here. And so here I am a cherub, and I got the one wing out to this side, and that thing measures five cubits, and the other one is five cubits, and the span between them is ten. You say, well, how is this possible? 
Well, it must be that the wings can just kissed each other in the center of the back, like perhaps my two scapula coming together if I did this type of thing. But it made for 10 cubits. And then there was another cherub next to it, uh, verse 25, the other cherub was 10 cubits. Both the cherubims were of one measure and uh, one size, and the height of one cherub was 10 cubits, and so was the other cherub. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. So he, he set them up in the most holy place, which I know is 20 cubits wide, and he's got one 10 cubits to 10 cubits, and the other guy is touching his wing, and his other wing's touching the wall. And so it's spanning the entire uh, length or breadth of that oracle inside of there. And he overlaid the cherubims with gold. So I'm looking at this and I'm trying to learn a few things. Uh, the one thing I want to say is later on we were, you know, in, in Hebrews, and I've, I've had many people study this, but the one thing he did say in the book of Hebrews, chapter uh, 9, we were looking at before, verse 5, over it, that would be over the ark, uh, the cherubims of glory were shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly, he says in Hebrews 9.5. So the only thing I want to say there, and I've, I've heard a lot of studies about cherubims, we can speak in generalities about them, but not particularly. Right. And uh, I've, I've taken a look at the passages in Ezekiel 1 and, and uh, Revelation and tried to sort that whole thing out. And I can get generalities, and I've read other people with their generalities, but you really can't get a particularity about it. Um, because here's the reality. The Bible is a book about God and his relationship to men. It's not a book about God and his relationship to angels and cherubs. Now, God in his revelation lets us know, oh, by the way, folks, in the spirit world, there's a lot of other stuff, but that's peripheral. Don't focus on it and don't try to get particular about it. That's when you start getting through the glass darkly. If you want to, leave it to your own imagination, but certainly don't fight and divide over it. One of the great problems we have in Christianity is we fight more with each other than we do with lost people. Now, we shouldn't be fighting with anybody. But, but, but the reality is we're in a battle. We're in a battle for the faith. And we studied the other day in Thessalonians, when we're out there battling for the faith and we're not fighting flesh and blood, we're, we're wrestling for the minds and the hearts and the souls of men to give them the gospel. And we're supposed to keep a breastplate on of, remember what it's, faith and love. That's Thessalonians, not Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is a different breastplate. That's our fight with the devil. But when it comes to with people, our breastplate is faith and love. Right. When we're fighting those folks out there, faith is what we're supposed to be carrying, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and love. We're supposed to love them as we're bringing the faith to them. Now, the breastplate we fight with the devil, that's a different area. But in this arena, faith and love. Now, Okay, we well, lost people. How about with each other? Well, we shouldn't even be fighting with each other. But if we are, and we'd let faith and love be our breastplate, I don't think there'd be as many divisions as there are in Christianity. So that, that's just one issue. I mean, this, this uh, don't fight over cherubims and peripheral stuff, please. Let it drop. Uh, we don't need to be fighting over things. What we need to be doing is to put the breastplate of faith and love out there and go uh, fight the good fight of faith to win lost people to the glory of God and Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't be fighting with each other. And God took a long time to teach me this. And, and I, I work now with the pastors and men, uh, not on a regular basis, but I do work with them who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't even know which Bible is God's. They're confused about a lot of stuff, but you know what? That's my brother for eternity. And the Bible issue, God's going to straighten out with him real soon. The trumpet's going to sound when he's going to straighten him out. Now, since I only have so much time on my hand, I mostly fellowship with people that believe the King James Bible because it's easier to communicate with them. We're using the same words and we're out there, but we've got to learn to stop fighting with each other. We can't fight with each other. Amen. Go ahead. 
In, in meekness, we instruct those that oppose themselves. Yeah, yeah. And so there's no, no need for us to fight them. So the first thing about the cherubims, you can't speak particularly. Second, a couple other things I learned about them. Uh, one, of, one of which is this. Well, God said that you're not supposed to make images of anything. Exodus 20. So why did God tell them to make cherubims? Isn't that wrong? Isn't that idolatry? Well, if you go back to Exodus 20 and you read the verse very carefully. Again, here's where the critic and the skeptic is always looking for some reason uh, not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be cleansed from his sin and rather to be a lover of darkness and sin rather than a lover of God. And that's his choice. He's got a free will. But for those of us that are trying to get close to God, when, when God spake these words in Exodus 20 to his children, of which we are <laughs> spiritually, uh, he explains, verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above. Now, this is God instructing the men in kings to make a cherubim in the most holy place unto him. Why would you tell me to do that, Lord? Because this is a representation of what is going on in heaven where the Lord sits on the throne and round about him thousands of thousands and ten thousands of ten thousands minister to him and watch. And part of those are the cherubims described in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, and Revelation chapter 4. And so this is, he's, I'm giving you a portrait, and if I'm going to dwell down here on earth, I want a representation of what I'm dwelling with in heaven. It was made unto God not unto the people. Amen. And they were following God's specific instructions. That's right. There is no contradiction here. Right. It's a matter of obedience to God. And they're putting something in the most holy place, which incidentally nobody went into except the high priest once a year. So it wasn't made unto anybody. The other thing I thought that was interesting is these cherubims uh, were made of an olive tree in verse uh, 23. And they were overlaid with gold in the verse, uh, what is it, uh, 29? No, verse 28. And, uh, and I thought that was most curious because the cherubims are a spiritual creatures, a representation of spiritual creatures. And it's showing that um, I believe that those spiritual creatures are uh, bipartite, if you will. I believe they're bipartite. And that's what he's trying to show you here. They have a, a, a body to them, which is represented by the uh, olive tree. And they have a uh, spiritual component, which is represented by the gold. And I believe that's uh, how they are made. And, but, but then again, I'm not going to argue about it, but it's just a thought. One thing I do know for sure is they're 10 cubits high. And, and, and uh, according to the cubit being made here, and I'm going to assume, but I don't know, well, yes, brother. I, said, I don't know if you took a look at this guy's but what's, what's an olive, like what kind of wood is the olive tree? Is it like, like bamboo or something? Is it, is it hard? Is it soft? Like, what is and they, it? No, no, the olive tree, that's very interesting. The olive tree, I, I was studying that out. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, first off, I think it's one of the four trees in the garden. Yes. Amen. In, in the Garden of Eden, there are pretty much kind of four trees that are mentioned there. There's the, the, uh, the, the tree of knowledge, good and evil. There's the uh, tree of life. There's the bramble tree. And there's the fig tree kind of mentioned in that whole, those whole two chapters there. And I think from the parable as we studied back in uh, Judges chapter 9, uh, Jotham's parable, it appears as you run those things down that uh, it talks about the parable of, of the trees. And he mentions the olive tree, the fig tree, the vine tree and the bramble. So I already know about the brine, uh, the, the, the uh, bramble and the fig that leaves left over the olive and the uh, vine. And, and so then I'm thinking in my mind, probably the vine represents the tree of knowledge of good and evil because a vine brings forth grapes. And I know grapes can bring forth two kinds of wine, good wine, that would be good and fermented, that would be evil. And so that's probably the uh, tree of uh, good and evil. And then the tree of life probably was the olive tree. And look at the word, O live, O live, life. 
Okay, so the olive tree is probably the tree of life, and it's a hard type of a tree. And I noticed here that the mention in verse 23, this is the sixth reference of the olive tree in the third Old Testament book. And it's mentioned in 23, 31, verse 32, and verse 33. That's the ninth. So mention six, seven, eight, and nine of the olive tree are put there. I, I think it represents the tree that Jesus hung on in his humanity, that he hung on an olive tree, and that's what brought forth life. And it represents, let's see, verses uh, mentioned six, seven, eight, and nine. That's from humanity through uh, spiritual completion, through the new birth, through spiritual fruit. And it's interesting, if you total the verses up, 23 plus 31 plus 32 plus 33, that equals 119. The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. And that's all about the Word of God. Amen. And maybe the first Bible was printed on pages from an olive tree. I don't know. But nonetheless, it's a representation. The olive tree is a representation of what I believe is the Word of God, whether it be a Jesus Christ giving life or the Bible itself. What I found very most interesting is the 14th reference of the word olive tree in the seventh book. That be seven plus seven plus seven is Jeremiah eleven sixteen. And uh, again, the olive tree is a type of the word of God we're going to see is, is the King James Bible. Uh, the King James Bible is a 1611. So I, these are just interesting things I found in my, my studies here. But getting back to these uh, cherubs, I believe it shows they're bipartite in nature. But one thing it does show me absolutely is they're 10 cubits tall. And if they're using the short cubit, that would make them 15 feet tall. And uh, just looking at dimensions, because we've thought about this a number of times, uh, people always seem to be frightened when an angel appears. And maybe it's because they're 15 feet tall. And, and maybe that's, that would, I guess a 15 foot tall thing might scare you. Especially if it was proportionately built, well built at 15 feet tall. I mean, everybody thinks Goliath was scary and he was nine plus feet tall. 15 feet tall would probably put a good fright in you. And the, these are just speculations I'm going on here. Uh, again, there were giants in those days. The Bible says in Genesis 6. And we know the giant was six cubits tall. And there were giants in those days. I think God's trying to tell you he made men as giants. Adam was six cubits tall. He was the size of Goliath. And the men lived that were six cubits tall. But that's before the flood. But after the flood, everybody shrunk. We're now four cubits because one third of us is dead. That's a two plus two plus two. Spirit, soul, body, but we're spiritually dead. The average man's four cubits tall. Our life has been shortened from a thousand to a hundred years. Our IQ has been shrunk from about a thousand to a hundred. And so we all been shrunk. But I think God originally made Adam six cubits tall. And, um, if Adam had been obedient, God would have grown him up. Canst thou add one cubit to thy stature? He would have gone from six to seven. But these cherubs are ten. Because in the hierarchy of creation, angels are above, this is Psalm 8, angels are above men, which are above uh, mammals, which are above uh, uh, birds, uh, swimming cr creatures and birds, and that's all that you can follow that out in Psalm 8. So I just think these things are big. They're big. That's all I'm trying to say, and I think that's what we're going to try and show you here. But that's just fun stuff, and who really cares? Getting back to the important thing is the fact that God is telling them to put this in there because it's a representation of where he lives in heaven. And again, it's overlaid with gold. It's a precious temple. It's expensive. One day when we get to the New Jerusalem, the streets are of gold. The foundations are of precious stones. It's like uh, Salvatore's Garden on steroids. Only people in Western New York would understand that. But uh, it's uh, you know very expensively uh, built. Uh, uh, we might think it's ornate. Some people might think gaudy. But I think we'll have eyes that can handle it at that particular time. And um, again... Verse 29, he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers within 
and without. And again, it's the portrait of the angelic host, the uh, redeemed men, trees, men as trees, who are now redeemed, their palms off for worship, and open flowers, they're growing up and mature. When the day comes that we're before the Lord, we're going to be growing up. That's one of the great jobs that Jesus is going to have to do is grow us all up in the millennium. And he'll do that. And he won't have to present little babies before his father. We'll be better than weaned children. We'll be grown and mature before the father so we can give him the proper worship when we come in his presence. And again, verse 30, the floor of the house was overlaid with gold, just like the new Jerusalem within and without. And 31, and for the entering of the oracle, he made the doors of olive tree. The lintel and the side posts were the fifth of the wall. The two doors also were of olive tree. And he carved upon them carvings of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers. And he overlaid them with gold and spread gold upon the cherubims and upon the palm trees. He also made uh, for the door of the temple posts of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall. And the two doors were of fir tree and Two leaves of the one door were folding and two leaves of the other door were folding and he carved thereupon cherubims and palm trees and open flowers and covered them with gold fitted upon the gold uh, of the carved work and he built the inner court with three rows of huge stone and a row of uh, cedar beams. And, and again, he's giving more of the design and the details. And I'm not real good at structural uh, stuff. That's not my strength. But the interesting thing I thought was verse 31. He made for the entering of the oracle, he made the doors of the olive tree. And, and, and here's the oracle. The oracle, let's say, represents the word of God. Because committed to the Jews were the oracle, the word of God. And the entering of the oracle is made of the olive tree. And, and basically what, what God is saying is if you want to enter the word of God, you want to come through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is on a cross. Probably the olive tree is what he hung on. The real entry to this Bible isn't so much Genesis 1-1, although that's a good entry point, but, but you might even believe in creation because I know of lost Catholics that believe in creation and yet they don't believe in the full atoning work, the propitiatory work of Jesus Christ and they've never been born again and really the way to enter into the oracle of God is through Jesus Christ. He is the way he is the truth. He is the life and that's the way you must enter in is through the one that gave life on the tree of life the olive tree the one that hung and said father forgive them they know not what they do and the lord jesus christ says come unto me all ye that labor and that i found was was uh, most interesting Amen. i'm running out of time but notice at the end verse 37 it says in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month Ziph. And in the 11th year, in the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it, so was he, that would be Solomon, uh, seven years in building it. And again, the portrait of how the temple is a picture of the Bible, particularly the King James Bible. They had traveled through the wilderness with the tabernacle. They had entered into the Holy Land with the tabernacle at Gibeon and at various places. But now finally, after many years of working with the Jewish people, long beyond the call of Abram, long after Moses came down from the mount, long after they left Egypt and entered the Promised Land and Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, long after the time of Judges, God now erects this temple for his people. It's a picture of how God, working through the New Testament, Testament took time before he finally gave us the finished King James Bible. It began, notice, in the fourth year, verse 37, and was finished in the 11th. And in 1604, King James convened the Hampton Court Conference, which began the building, the erecting, the writing, the putting together of the King James Holy Bible. 
and in 1611, the King James Holy Bible was completed, and it was seven years in the making. Now, curiously, that's kind of prophesied in the Bible in Psalm number 12. Psalm number 12. He says, um, help Lord for the godly man ceaseth for the faithful a fail from among the children of men. He talks about all these uh, people that speak vanity with a double heart, all these lying things and, uh, and they're oppressing people. But here's the beautiful thing that God's done in the midst of all that goes on. Verse six, the words of the Lord are pure words, just like the gold in that temple was pure gold. As silver tried in a first of earth, purified, there it is, seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Purified seven times in the Bible, a time and times and half a time. He uses the word times like a year. One time is one year. A half a time is a half a year. Times is two years. Seven times is seven years. In the King James Bible, they began the work in 1604. They finished it in 1611. That's seven years. Just like the temple, it was seven times in the preparation, years long. And so there it is again. Solomon, like I showed you, is a picture of the church. And the church was used by God to put the King James Bible together. It was uh, committed unto the saints, uh, born again men that worked over there. In, in England, putting it together. The church did it. Uh, Solomon was the son of David. David was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Solomon is a child of David, just as we are the children of Jesus Christ by putting our faith in him and in God. We become his children, and we were the ones that God used in putting the Bible together. Uh, God used the men uh, the children of God, if you will. Solomon, as you know, uh, again, it's a picture of the church. The church started out in the high place, like Solomon, the book of Proverbs. But then Solomon fell all the way to the book of Ecclesiastes by the end of his life. And here he is early on, and he's doing his work. And the church will fall into the Laodicean age. But then the Song of Solomon, he'll be raptured, come away, my fair one. And the church is taken away. But it's the church's work. God has committed this work to his people. And so so the Bible is both like Jesus divine and human. It's divine. It's God's words, but it's human just like uh, Christ was divine and a man. And there it is and there's the picture in that uh 7 year period. And when we get to chapter 8 in a few weeks You'll observe that he'll talk more about the dedication of that particular temple. And you'll notice that that uh, day, when we look at it, that that chapter is 66 verses in length. Just like your Bible is 66 books together. And that will be the dedication of that temple. And it's the King James Bible, which is 66 books. The Old Testament given to the Jews actually was only 24 scrolls. And the New Testament was 27 scrolls. And so there was only 51 scrolls. It wasn't until at the Hampton Court when they divided, rightly divided the word of truth and separated the books of Kings and separated Ezra and Nehemiah and did it exactly as God directed that it became 66 books. So we'll look at that in a few weeks. Uh, any other questions on what we looked at tonight? Yes, brother. Yeah, shittim wood is a unique wood that's found in a desert type of an area. It's able to grow in an area where there's very little water. Somehow it's able to get its roots down and to draw water from deep. It's kind of an incorruptible wood. It's resistant to bugs. It's resistant to all kinds of stuff. And so that particular type of wood was used, at, yes, brother, in the, in the ark. Yeah, yeah, that would be like Isaiah 53, like a root out of dry ground, a plant coming out of there. That would be the type of wood the shittim wood is. Yes? Well, it's interesting that, you know, I never really considered, or I never considered, that in essence what the ark was, the, in a historical context, is it was like a safe. I mean, you think about it, if you have an important document, or you make a covenant with somebody, you sign an agreement, you're going to put that thing in a safe place where it's not going to be corrupted. 
And that's what that thing was. That was their safe. That was their lockbox, that heart. You didn't want that to be in trouble because that contained the covenant that God made with man. It contained the rod that budded, which was a testimony of the Levitical priesthood. Yeah. God had chosen the Levite as a priest. And it contained that that pot was manna, which was a testimony that this was God's people that he had divinely fed for 40 years. So these were like these, these mementos of the fact that God had chosen his people and they were, it was in this safe, it was in this box. You know, it's just, it's interesting. you never think of it in a historical context, yeah. but that's basically what it was. And yes, it's all pictures then forward of what God is doing in Christ. In this Amen. So it is, it is, there are so many beautiful facets to the portraits that God uh, pictures there. Yes, brother. Our Lord, in South America, more in Brazil, there is a, a cult called uh, Padre de Supreme, which is, uh, says, stop suffering. It's a church. Okay. Well, sure, sure. There's a cult down there, he says, in Brazil, and they like to build or reproduce temples like that. Again, uh, not understanding the book of Hebrews, that the first covenant has been put away, that without all contradiction, the, the uh, less is blessed of the better, and the better covenant is the new covenant, and we've now moved from the physical to the spiritual, but some people are still stuck in the, in the physical. Uh, the Catholics are like that too. They do so many things of a carnal, physical, earthly nature, and they miss the spiritual. So, I mean, we, we, we study these and what they were physically, but we are looking upward and forward, and they're looking for downward and backwards. And it's sad, but that's human nature. <laughs> right? We tend to be physical. And I'd like a milkshake right about now. Yes. Um, <laughs> Does the book come? There could be a type there of a millennium where you have the kingdom of God, you know, spiritual bodies and then human bodies mixed together. Yeah. Yeah, then he's looking at the possibility of men being likened to cedar trees. It might be in Ezekiel, yes. Yeah. I mean, the millennial kingdom is a most interesting kingdom because you're going to have people in human bodies and you're going to have some saints, uh, Christian saints in glorified bodies at the same time. It's going to be a most interesting mix. And I also wonder if at that particular time, since Christ will be here himself, and the angels that have been under chains of darkness will now be released, at least the holy angels that minister to him, and, and you'll be able to see them. It could be a most interesting time. But uh, I don't know all the answers to these things. So if anyone does, just write them in, write the answers in, I'll be happy to question them. Yes? Does it specify if they're like, actually in the image of the cherubim in Revelation 4? Like, do they have it, like the face of an eagle, for instance? Yes, there, there, there's, there are two passages. Uh, one is in Ezekiel 1, and then it's further upon Ezekiel 10, and then it's Revelation 4, I think it's verse 7. And you can take the time on your own to go home and write those verses side by side and follow the tracking of the outline of the order of those cherubims and study them. And I've done it for hours, and I can't figure a whole heck of a lot out. Revelation 4 is not cherubim, it's seraphim. If you compare Revelation yeah. 4 with Isaiah 6, those are seraphim. Yeah. The cherubim are Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10. 10, yeah, those are definite. But if you look at these things, you'll see the difference. And, and it's just, the, I can't quite get a fix on it. I can't. And I'm, I'm sure the Lord will teach us. The, the book is about God and his relationship to men. He does mention those things are there. They are there. And uh, one day I think he'll instruct us and in all that stuff. But it is curious. Uh, people are always more interested in what's not given to them than they are in what has been given to them. I'm, I'm always surprised by that. I mean, here's the Bible. You can learn so much about God. I'm not interested. Tell me about these obscure passages where there's nothing about, and let's go fight on this uh, little merry-go-round cul-de-sac uh, hobby horse for the rest of our lives and miss the major points, which is Jesus Christ and uh, walking in meekness and trying to get a gospel out. <laughs> yeah. All right.